Good afternoon, and on behalf of the Leeds Civic Trust, may I welcome you to this talk given by Dr. Rachel Unsworth. The title, as you can see, is Inspirations for Creativity in Leeds, Learning from the Past, Creating the Future. And as you probably will well know, Rachel is very well qualified to talk about this. She is by professional background an urban geographer and has been concerned for many years with urban planning and the development of Leeds and the history of Leeds, its creativity and indeed its, its future. That's enough for me. Can I just pass you over to, to Rachel Unsworth for this talk on inspirations for creativity in Leeds? So I was asked to do a talk on innovation in Leeds for the previous Heritage Open Days opening session in 2022. That got delayed and I did a talk on that this time last year. And that was easy in a way because I just drew on our book, Leeds Cradle of Innovation, and so many different kinds of, of innovation uh, included in, in this showing off about Leeds through all time. And it, it, it covers uh, new kinds of machinery, but also new systems, new ways of doing things, um, and also, uh, you know, people who had to uh, do the campaigning that uh, brought about transformational legislation at national level. And it brings it right up to date with creativity or innovation, I should say, in uh, the cultural sector and in digital and in all sorts of, of medical ways you know, that build on our past as a, as a place of, of surgical and, and clinical innovation. Um, but this time uh, I was asked to talk about creativity for the opening of Heritage Open Days. Um, and I think that's something that's on a slightly less kind of high plane than, than innovation. The bar is a bit lower for what counts as creativity. I don't think you can be an innovator without being creative, but there's lots of creativity that doesn't meet the criteria for kind of groundbreaking systemic change. But uh, creativity can be seen in all sorts of fairly small scale examples and can also uh, is also a vital part of how we make things happen. So it's not just about the physical outputs, though I am going to talk mainly about the, uh, the, the physical uh, cityscape that is the main concern of the Civic Trust. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk also though about the creativity required to make things happen. So I'm going to cover some in, enduring and some contested principles by which the built environment gets transformed and um, talk about new departures and ways in which we have to try to break with some of the old ideas and structures in order to accommodate new um, ways in which this, the city is, is uh, uh, developing. Um, so to make change happen. <laughs> Yes, and we also need to think about the campaigners, not just the, the people who are um, more obviously involved in uh, creating the, the built environment. I'm going to take you on a walk in a way that we couldn't if it was out there in real life in the streets, uh, dotting around here, there and everywhere. It would be pretty exhausting and long anyway if we did do it like this. And I'm going to do a sort of case study, particularly on the reinvention of the South Bank, the buildings themselves, but also that whole, that long story of trying to transform from an industrial place through post-industrialism and out into a new era. And uh, then just briefly mentioning some continuing challenges, but that could be a huge section of its, of its own. Um, you'll, perhaps those of you who know Leeds well will know that this is the new kind of High Line Garden on the top of the viaduct that uh, comes towards what's now Wellington Place. Now, enduring principles. So we still uh, stick with many of the ideas from classicism, proportions and some of the features. And here I happen to be able to take this picture of the town hall when... Um, 
it uh, just it happens to exemplify this notion of a global style uh, that we've drawn on it here in Leeds. And this was just before the King was about to visit Leeds in November 2022. But uh, while the, the these um, columns with their Corinthian capitals and many features of the town hall can be found on neoclassical buildings around the world, um, there are also elements of this that are local and are particular to Leeds and particular to the craftspeople who worked on this building. So we have Catherine Moore, whose husband died during the making of the town hall. And this is said to be her portrait of him just tucked around the side, around the west side. And this is said to be by her. She carried on with the family business and she herself was a sculptor, most unusually back in the 1850s and onwards. And this is, of course, a reference to the local economy based on wool for centuries. And that's the economy that we've built on subsequently. Uh, so much of the wealth that came from that was the money that went into making the town hall and more besides. So I want to just I want to juxtapose this, the the grand ideas that continue to inspire us from elsewhere. But then the creativity that wells up from within the place. Here's a case of Greek revival. I call this Greek revival with Yorkshire characteristics because you can see the Yorkshire roses here along with the Greek key, which I think is very charming. And here a Yorkshire rose on a humble downpipe, but made into you know, a minute little element of beauty around the side of a bank building, in, a former bank building in Park Row. We've got another of the great global styles here, stolen probably from the Saracens, as um, uh, the um, uh, author, uh, oh, she's called Dark, and I've just forgotten her first name. That's, I'm sorry about that. Um, she shows us that our style isn't just a European style, but is, is taken from further east. And so Gilbert Scott uh, was the great exponent of this, got his chance to show us how to do neo-Gothic, only a stone's throw from the neoclassical town hall. And um, here it is in its glorious um, Technicolor. Um, and uh, with this, this portico alone is a, a kind of lesson in how to do the neo-Gothic. So many different materials and uh, little bits of styling there. And this was definitely in the era of creating buildings that were supposed to inspire the people of the town and to attract visitors and other people to come and do business here. So John Barron, in, in commissioning this building from Thomas Ambler, his friend, uh, was definitely in that line of, you know, we're not just going to have an ordinary factory and warehouse. We're going to make it an inspiration. And um, surely Thomas Ambler had seen this copy of the book by um, Owen Jones with scale drawings of the Alhambra Palace in, um, in southern Spain, in Granada. And this is the copy from the Leeds Library. We know that he was involved with the new room and the new staircase uh, design at the Leeds Library. So this is probably the very copy that he saw. So he was trying to make something exotic and linking leads to the merchant tradition and the wider world. Uh, it was for John Barron. Now, John Barron gets into the book twice over for his innovations in the clothing uh, industry, being a pioneer of ready-made clothing, and also for getting around a park for the town. So in innovation, creativity, but certainly there was a lot of uh, very kind of determined thinking here um, and keeping going with uh, trying to make this happen. Um, so a, a park that had already been imagined and brought into being by Nicholson. And then it was the imaginative process of John Barron that, that made it a, a civic asset. Also with Thomas Ambler, he realized that we needed more space for traffic in those days and they widened Boar Lane, knocked down the properties on the south side and then sold the plots for new buildings. And Thomas Ambler designed most of them. We're now in a phase of, by the way, it's going back to having uh, less space for traffic, uh, more space for uh, pedestrians and bikes. But at this stage, it was all about making the roads wider. 
But on the south side, we've got this um, charming array of buildings, which uh, Janet Douglas um, says is a delightful skyline of molded parapets, statuary and spiky turrets. <laughs> so um, the, here's uh, Venice coming, coming to a northern industrial town. Even where it's not fancy stonework, there's very beautiful brickwork in some buildings. And we've got here the so-called flat iron building that predates the more famous one in New York and with most exquisite brickwork. So you can see work like this in other places, but this is unique to Leeds and this is incredibly good workmanship. The skill involved here, I think, deserves to be celebrated as well as the uh, the skill of the person who designed it. Here is some more um, beautiful combination of, of stone and brick. Ordinary buildings, but unique. And then we went back after a period of modernism, went back to using polychromatic materials in what was then denigrated as the offence of the inoffensive, the Leeds look. We're still wondering what we now think of this, and I wonder which of these buildings will be saved as listed buildings into the future, and in their turn uh, become adapted maybe for other uses, um, added to, amended. It's certainly what's happened to some of our modern buildings. Just going back to uh, some of the more classically inspired buildings, here's the, the board school board building of the early 1880s, and um, very typical of its era by George Corson, one of our great architects. Around the side, something quite novel, I think prefiguring a simpler styling. Um, and uh, I really like that seize the day window. Inside, it's an absolute um, eruption of, <laughs> of creative design. Um, somebody went mad with the tile catalog and there was uh, all this fancy ironwork as well. And then the cute little owls, uh, owls all the way along the railings outside. This is the tile, the tile catalogue. We'll have some of those and some of those. And, oh yes, <laughs> so it's still a much um, admired and enjoyed building. Another Broderick building now, along with the town hall, he did this and the corn exchange. And just these little details that lift it out of being just an ordinary building that you see anywhere. These are unique. Somebody suggested maybe this is meant to be very stylized ram's horns. A link to the, the sheep behind our great industry of the past. Just on the topic of railings, these in South Parade and on Wellington Street Again, quite creative, adding something to the streetscape. And this is one of my favourite buildings in Leeds, tucked away in York Place and not a street that you really notice much. It's quite narrow. I took this picture on a summer's evening where you actually do get sunshine coming along from the west. And it's by Stephen Smith, an architect who was still quite a young man at this time, later went into partnership with Tweedale, who'd been a pupil of his. And this is a building from the early 1870s. So um, quite stylish in its proportions and its ornamentation, which is, which is restrained, but uh, very, very beautiful, I think. Um, just still on railings, um, a latter-day example here in Trinity that's been open more than 10 years already. And here, a humble municipal structure on the Ginnell system coming down into town from Chapel Allerton. Now, very ordinary railings, given a bit of creative treatment by Seagull's Paints, who do such great work diverting paint from the waste stream they get paid to take it and um, uh, process it and make it available uh, to, at good prices so that people can carry out projects around the city. So this is, I think, a great example of creative thinking. Back to the 19th century again, the, the 1890s here with the Yorkshire Penny Bank headquarters building with a feature here that is 
only about making it a noticeable building. It's not useful as such. It's about how it strikes the viewer and about being rather grand. But here we've got a very small feature, uh, surely the cutest unicorn in Leeds, perhaps in a wider area, maybe to appeal to children, bringing their, their full little piggy banks to be unlocked uh, in the bank for their savings to be deposited. Of the same sort of, just a little bit later, early Edwardian, a building that the architectural historians end up just saying, eclectic. This was at a time when it could have been uh, a terracotta, it isn't, it's all in stone on the exterior here. And uh, on the inside, some of the this terracotta, which is also used on the outside of lots of our buildings in Leeds. And I've deliberately crowded this slide with terracotta examples, exterior and interior. You can imagine how with an excess of this kind of decorative feature, there was a longing for something completely different. Um, after the First World War, we got the strict classical style, amongst other styling. Uh, some, of, some of this counts as, as art deco, really, but the strict classical end of art deco, as opposed to the more jazzy, colorful style. And then even more austere, after the Second World War and into the 60s and 70s. And I quite like this um, looking up from Bond Street to what was West Riding House is now called Pinnacle above the car park there. And with the what was the Bond Street Centre now part of Trinity behind me. So a completely different kind of styling. Um, and in place of a Gilbert Scott building here, which the Civic Trust sadly failed to save, but um, was one of the buildings that they they were set up to try to save. They had more success later on. But uh, this building has gone, so has this building. And on, on the site of what was the museum, Philosophical Hall, um, there is now the HSBC building in a very different style. I've come to quite appreciate this building having not been a fan initially. And I think it's often the way that it takes a bit of getting used to new kinds of buildings. And then you, you see the proportions and the way the light strikes it. And I think it does have its merits. The light goes through the fronts of these buildings, uh, replacing Victorian buildings that replaced earlier buildings. And uh, in fact, this building is the, at least the fourth building on the site. And heaven knows how many buildings predate the Harvey Nicks on Brigade. But is this uh, creative or is it just modern buildings trying to sort of uh, melt into the historic uh, streetscape? Uh, we have many of our modern buildings have been reworked in recent years, uh, including um, City House above the station. And the end wall here is uh, the canvas for what was at the time it was finished in 2018, the tallest mural in Europe, it was said, uh, called Athena Rising, deliberately the owl, symbol of Leeds, symbol of the Civic Trust, associated, by the way, with the cloth industry in classical times. So the goddess Athena slash Minerva is associated with owls and the statue in Brigitte of Minerva she has a, a little owl sort of mask perched on her forehead. So now we have an era into the 21st century. We've got another terracotta revival. After the terracotta revival of the 1880s onwards, we've now got a return to using terracotta cladding, but of a very different kind of styling, but it's very, very deliberately designed in this case to echo both the terracotta past and the past of textiles. So this is meant to look like the warp threads of, of a textile, as well as being this, tip, this you know, typical Leeds glazed uh, terracotta, the, the faience, faience, new student flats on the east side of town. And the John Lewis store, how long? We don't know, um, was also specially commissioned for Leeds. Um, they didn't want to have owls here. They wanted something that was more abstract. And this, uh, these various kinds of ceramic are specially commissioned for this exterior treatment of the building. 
here we've got the 1980s playhouse uh, being turned around and given a new front and the Architects Page Park worked with Darwin Terracotta um, in Blackburn to create this new front, which uh, is just opposite the bus station. And uh, on the night when it was inaugurated, that illuminated sign at the top actually read thus. And I just wondered if that was deliberate to make everybody put it on social media as the, the uh, the Leeds Playhouse. <laughs> We've got some combinations of different eras. Wherever you look, you know, because a, an old place is forever having to adapt to new requirements, we sometimes get very interesting juxtapositions. Sometimes they work, and sometimes I think it just um, is quite a kind of. Mm, eclecticism of chance, shall we say, to put it kindly. Uh, here we've got the 1770s granary at the terminus start of the Leeds and Liverpool Canal where it meets the River Air, and above it, the early 21st century tower of Bridgewater Place. What do we think of that? Tradition and modernity in stark contrast. Here behind the premises of the Oates family. And uh, next door, we've got a, a building again with a ceramic treatment. So what a contrast between this probably 18th century building, maybe, maybe a bit earlier, 18th century anyway. And it goes through to Queen's Court there. Uh, and then we've got this as their next door neighbor on Call Lane. Very striking, certainly. People living back in the city centre now after years of the city centre not having residents. Another interesting juxtaposition here next to the Corn Exchange, I think that this building, which is residential, has been very respectful of its neighbour, uh, having that slight curve, being of a similar sort of height, giving enough distance between it and the Grade 1 listed Corn Exchange of Cuthbert Broderick. I think a great success there. And then we've got these examples of buildings, really what I call working with the grain of the past. Um, so here, the East Street Mills, using a, a mid 20th century building and adding to it. Sometimes these upward extensions just look kind of top heavy and just what they are, which is more lettable or sellable space. But sometimes they're, I think, very sensitively integrated as also in the Bragg building on top of and behind the old mining building um, built in 1930. Um, we've got a greatly extended amount of space for the new um, coming together of computing and uh, various kinds of physical sciences. Um, and here at uh, Park Place, a Georgian street turning the corner into what had been a street, another street of Georgian houses, replaced by uh, Victorian premises and, uh, you know, later rebuilds and so on. But uh, as it comes along Park Place, it steps up using a material that isn't the same, but is a similar colour. And then as it turns the corner, does something different. And I think this is unique to that spot on the Earth's surface, and I think is a creative way to deal with that site in a, in a sensitive but original way. We've got all sorts of changes of use. Amazing, you know, when you look um, at what was on those sites, when I sometimes show the picture looking up Park Row in the 1860s, and there's only Mill Hill Chapel that's the same building as you can now see. And uh, so many buildings that uh, the, the people of yesteryear would think, you what? <laughs> how, can, how can these changes have come about? You know, here's the part of what was the third white cloth hall at ground level and covering a huge site of which this is just one wing. And then on top of it, the old assembly rooms of Georgian times. And now having gone through various uses is a meditation center for a Buddhist group. Extraordinary. And there are so many other examples around the city. Now, I'm going to give you this case study about the South Bank uh, very rapidly. Uh, this is um, 
an amazing piece of work where these people went up in a balloon and sketched madly while they were up there and then came down to ground level, filled in the detail and then sold the picture back to Leeds. They did it in some other places as well. And we, this is a great record of Leeds at that time. Uh, a very busy place, loads of chimneys, uh, housing in amongst the heavy industry and the, the river snaking through town as it still was in 1886, about to become a city. So, so much um, change since then, um, painfully achieved, um, sometimes with great difficulty. So come with me over Leeds Bridge. I just love the creative way that uh, a visitor, David Crozier, used a particular app and his um, photographic uh, system to be able to pick out the newly painted railing on Leeds Bridge there on a frosty day last year. So during the noughties, the civic architect uh, went through a lot of work trying to find ways to make sense of the chaotic legacy of Leeds um, in this post-industrial era and tried to pull out some principles by which we could remake it. More recently, we've had this Our Spaces strategy, which is you know, the latest sort of incarnation about how we connect places up better. But now I'm going to peel things back um, to um, thinking about the, the development intensity of this part of town. So we had the era of the Urban Development Corporation at those years in the late 20th century you can see that the map they used as their base map, already a lot of the old industry had gone. All the housing had been cleared from this area. Absolutely all the housing had gone. And nobody was living down here until there was a bit of redevelopment along the waterfront uh, starting in 1988. So this is the image in 2015. This is the image um, by 2022. So if you looked at these in detail, you would see that a lot of the uh, land area that had been just open car parks back in 2015, by this stage was either developed or was in the process of being developed. And if you took that picture again uh, and updated it this year, you'd find more changes again. So um, a dynamic in a very broad area uh, starting off with the waterfront developments, this was taken years ago down by the Canal Wharf. Um, this is when uh, this is taken from the years when the development agency was just contemplating what on earth to do with Leeds Dock, as it's now called, when there was you know very poor uh, selection of buildings and most of it redundant or going that way. It then became a, a very desirable area in the early 21st century. And with the Royal Armouries as part of the catalyst for bringing more development down here. And one of our six um, new footbridges that have come in the last 30 years. I was able to take this picture um, that nobody's ever been able to take before. Sun uh, seeming to be shining on Water Lane on a winter's day early last year, actually reflecting off Globe Point, a new building just on the, the other side of, of Holbeck, the eponymous Holbeck here. Um, so much reworking in this part of Holbeck and it's still ongoing. So the map that we made as the lead sustainable development group, which very much included people from the Civic Trust, we showed the areas that had already been picked off in the late 20th century into the 21st century as areas of regeneration. And then the areas that we knew were already sort of in the sights of developers, landowners. But then there were these beige areas for which there was no thinking, no, no creative thinking at all. And so the lead sustainable development group idea was that the whole of this South Bank area should be considered as a piece and that there should be integration about what happened where. The city council, however, had brought out just this document, which only covered the area here. And then they had to extend to a wider area because there was the 
promise slash threat slash, well, the idea of HS2 coming in. So gradually they were realizing that a wider area needed to be considered. This was largely the work of Peter Baker, uh, so long involved with the Civic Trust and uh, an entry for the Wilson Economics Prize in 2014. We didn't win, but it was a really useful exercise in trying to understand how this could be a coherent, sustainable neighbourhood for the long term. This was eventually the South Bank strategy as adopted by the City Council, and um, with some examples of the changes of use on the South Bank here, including the data centre for the north of England in what was the Salem Chapel. <laughs> Mind-blowing sort of change of use. And here the uh, one of the earliest developments, which was the reusing of the air and cold navigation warehouses as residential, reworking of Alf Cook's print works for the, for the uh, City College, and so on and so forth. So amazing changes, and um, including the, the Duke Studios here by Laura Wellington and her partner. Uh, uh, we just had completion last year of the reworking of Tower Works, uh, which was engineering works of uh, T.W. Harding, and uh, now completed. People started moving in in September. It was just, just before completion. They were rushing to finish the public space. That is, that's it before the development happened. That's now looking down from a very similar spot on the hotel at Brunnery Wharf. And you have to say, you wonder, oh, well, tower works, yeah, but they're somewhat kind of hidden by the new development. And Mustard Wharf wrapped around in this rather awkward site instead of the whole thing being developed all of a piece. Now, this is what the Leeds Sustainable Development Group was trying to urge, creative thinking, on a wider scale, but joined up between sites. There's still a chance to do some of that on the South Bank while respecting the listed buildings. Um, the, that does limit your degrees of freedom, but it also means that we have a unique place, doesn't it? So this is what was termed gems to be polished. And here are some of those buildings and structures that have yet to be fully um, brought back to useful life, including our amazing tower work, uh, temple works, which I hope will eventually become part of the British Library. Uh, it was just about to be sewn up before everything changed four years ago, but um, I, I hope I live to see it. And then there'll be more changes to come. These old mills on the far west side of, of Holbeck in a, the very old part of the, the old township of Holbeck, uh, surely this will be subject of some attention in future and looking down from the hotel to what has been a call center for the banking industry. I wonder if that would eventually be school premises for this side of the South Bank. We've got Ruth Gorse Academy further to the east and there will be a primary school at the Climate Innovation District. But what about this? I know there is a planning application in for this site, I think possibly just to test values. And uh, there's time to go for this, wouldn't it be good? So this was this was the work of Mike Piet, who's chaired the planning committee of the Civic Trust for such a long time and writes up the summary of how they've appraised the planning developments, planning proposals coming forward. And this was uh, his ideas about how this, uh, all these different functions need to be slotted in and linked together to make this a properly functioning, sustainable neighborhood. What about if Crown Point Retail Park, instead of being this vast car park with over 900 parking spaces for the public and then more besides, uh, whether this could be a park, you know, continuing where Air Park is in the making just over here? Uh, could this be playgrounds and sports facilities, more neighborhood shops with perhaps more sports facilities above, or residential above, you know, a completely reworked place, maybe with vertical farming here and elsewhere across the South Bank. I mean, all sorts of creativity needed to make this place really sing. You know, it's, it's been designated an extension of the city centre since 1993. 
and still many parts of it do not feel like city centre yet. So there's a lot of potential here. Climate Innovation District on the east side is still underway. They started on site back in 2017. That's a big project um, and uh, quite a new departure. That is in Cradle, in cradle of Innovation uh, because there's a whole lot of new thinking going, in, going into this. <clears throat> when Chris Thompson, the entrepreneur, took the proposal to the City Plans Panel, he was told, but this isn't a residential location. Um, and he was, he said, yeah, but I'm going to make it one. Actually, there were already some residences over here. There is a residential neighbourhood just over this side of the water. This is student residential. So it's a case of making a place. And um, this is in progress. Um, this is not just a CGI. This is actually how it is, uh, photos that I've taken. The former Tetley site now owned by Fastint um, is well on the way. Um, and they've got their own special logo for the notion that Air Park will be threaded through right from the David Odawali Bridge right through to beyond the Tetley site. They've deliberately acquired extra land here, so it's kind of a decent sized park. I understand that there is some problem now with uh, the density of development and just how much green space there will be, but I will say no more. But um, it would be a shame if there was any skimping on the amount of green space here. We sorely need it for between the end of the 18th century when Park Square was laid out and the making of Sovereign Square in 2016, there was no purpose made green space in central Leeds of any decent size. There were just little bits on the edges of some developments and the odd tree. Now we've got over, over 600 extra trees planted in the city centre as part of the, uh, the new um, our spaces strategy um, and this by the way is a deliberate echo by the landscape architects of the fact that there were goits of water coming from the river running un under this under this area now um, and and rejoining the river and um, the, these were to run mills on this site so very different uses here but still an echo of the past and more of the our spaces uh, coming into play with the greening of Cookridge Street and it then becoming a, a site for really imaginative artwork that was just for the duration of the International Piano Competition back in 21. Back to the uh, site next to the playhouse and uh, greening of this area here that has taken a few years back. It's now lo looking already quite mature and nearby we hope that the Civic Trust idea for greening this side of town, just be, be, here's the, the parish, the parish church, now the Minster, and that this tangle of road junction can be simplified, traffic kept out of here, perhaps daylight the beck on its way to the river air and create more green space. Um, and uh, let's hope that that actually does come off. Uh, just recently, there's been this new uh, little uh, linear park between the river and the canal on the west side of town. That was just finished the year before last. And then here, uh, beside where they've rebuilt the Regent Street flyover, some interesting, pleasant new planting just there. That's uh, It's just on here, and this is underneath. Um, this came into my street art presentation the other week. Um, by a, a wonderful young artist who's been given, who's been uh, commissioned to do quite a lot of work around the city, along with many other artists. It's uh, really changed. If you haven't been into the city centre for some time, you'll be quite surprised. Uh, on a very much smaller scale, um, here's wonderful endless creativity with the planting and the shifting around of the plants within the garden of the Duck and Drake at the bottom of Kergate. Fantastic, really devoted gardening going on there. And in the calls, uh, work between business there and the business improvement district, taking up a couple of parking spaces, creating a little pocket park that catches the sun coming through the gap over Centenary Bridge. Uh, fantastic little in in interventions. And then trying to um, entice people along the waterfront to make that more of an entertaining 
um, place. So artwork here. Oh, sorry, the, um, the this photograph is by Vicky Sharp. I, I swapped them over. The um, Heron was unveiled in the summer of 2019 when a boat chugged out of the way. And then we've got creativity just near the south end of Leeds Bridge with the making of the David Olawale Bridge and the making of this amazing artwork I've shown you on by uh, called Hibiscus Rising and here on, on a very different scale, a large scale bug hotel. <laughs> Now, I just want to say that, you know, there are good news stories and there are some things that work less well and uh, challenges that we still haven't managed to uh, fully grapple with. Um, and I think, think this photograph that I took from the top of um, what's now called Platform uh, somehow sums that up with the light and shade. So we looked down and Liz Minkin, who was a city councillor, said, Every building should be worth looking up at and every building should be worth looking down on. But I would just say, where are the solar panels? Where are the roof gardens? Where is the energy generation? And how much of this is truly affordable housing? So there are all sorts of massive challenges that we haven't yet fully grappled with. And uh, just to a rather uh, sunnier little um, work in progress, uh, the Civic Trust through the Building Preservation Trust that they have under their wing, um, working with the Friends of Round Hay Park and other interested folk, are going to try to bring these lodges back to life. And here's a potential commission for an artist, isn't there? That niche. And while we're on with it, potentially making the, the John Burns fountain in Round Hay Park work again. Um, and there are many more bigger problems to, to face, I know including the control and availability of water more widely. Um, here's an, another one. So what is what doing in City Square, I would say? Fine man, great engineer. Without him, you know, the Industrial Revolution wouldn't have started when it did, at least. And uh, yet it was our Matthew Murray who was to take this the uh, concept of the steam engine and turn it into a locomotive. And where is the prominent artwork to honour Matthew Murray. Well, he has some memorials down in the churchyard at St Matthew's down in Holbeck, a fittingly metal obelisk, and then this plaque in Water Lane, which most people just walk past, I'm sure, without even noticing. Wouldn't it be wonderful if for uh, the bicentenary of his death that comes up in 26, we could have something fitting for him. So, as the Wonderful artwork down in Mabgate says, creativity takes courage. And uh, it certainly took a lot of courage to do Leeds 2023 last year. So much going on around the city. There we were trying to say, well, we may not be able to be European scale city culture, but we're jolly well going to do it. I was there. I'm sure a lot of people on the call today can pick themselves out in this photograph taken from the top of what was the Tetley Art Gallery. That's in the process of change again. So I just want to say, these are some events coming up. Another chance to do the Terracotta Tour, uh, which has got the late 19th century into the Edwardian era revivals and the modern Terracotta revivals. It's about two miles and it's, it's quite taxing um, because there's just so much to see. Then I'm going to do this presentation about Temple Museum on uh, Valentine's Day. Um, and then uh, another outing, uh, about and for women of Leeds, but men are extremely welcome. One bold man came when I did the tour back in the autumn, uh, but you know, all, all comers are welcome. And then I'm going to do um, a tour of Chapel Allerton in April. I might put up some more, but I, I've got an absence coming up in late February into March when I go to visit my little granddaughter and her parents. Um, so I haven't got many public um, tours up in the calendar at the moment but there will be more to come and if you're not yet a subscriber to my website uh, to my you know my uh, alerts then do join via the city walking tours and uh, then you will get the alerts and it also happens that I run the events for the Leeds Phil and Lit so just if you look up Leeds Phil and Lit Leeds Philosophical and Literary Society you will find under events the program laid out and um they're not all there to book yet, but uh, the next, the next one, the next two are there, 
and uh, then we've got some more coming up and they come on through the year so you can uh, you're very welcome. It only costs £25 to join the society and then you'll always get to know about what's going on and be invited to other events. Um, but uh, they're free to attend for anybody. All right, so, um, and just to say, I'm supposed to be playing in this concert at the end of March and we're doing a, a Mozart fest. They were called the Leeds Haydn players. This time it's going to be his friend, Mozart. Okay, so I'll just go back to that and I'll stop sharing my screen and see what we have in the chat. Yeah, thank you very much for that, Rachel. Um, I must apologize, the chat was turned off for a large part of your talk due to some um, ineptitude on my part, but there are some comments there about Tower Works, mm. um, which I must admit, I fully agree with them. Uh, seeing the, seeing the, the, the three towers from the railway line or from the ground level, which is now virtually impossible. You can see them if you walk along the canal, but only just for a, a brief time as you're looking at the gap. Well, that's right. There is no vantage point now from which you can see all three towers, all no. of them, even from the top of that hotel. You know, mm. you'd have to have a drone to be able to see them all. Um, so uh, I, don't, I think it was a, t a typical example of where, despite you know the best endeavours of the planning department and the heritage team you know that they let the developers uh build to, uh, you know to to great amassing of, of buildings um, I, i'm not certain but i i'm pretty sure that the civic trust um did object to the to, 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 to that kind of um disposition on the principle that these heritage towers would, would be really obscured by the, by the blocks Mm. I'm not exactly certain what was said, but I know within within our planning committee we were very worried that what has happened would be the outcome was the mm. com a complete disappearance. And they're, they're wonderful towers. Yeah. To, 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 to Colonel Colonel Harding, Colonel Harding, I think, who who had them built in the first place. Yes, that's right. Mm. Colonel was just a courtesy thing. He was he wasn't actually, a, you know, a kind of wasn't a, a Waterloo or anything. No, he wasn't old enough to be that anyway. Uh, right. Um thank thank you for your um thank you for your comments, folks. And um yes, the idea of um doing swapsies and uh, um sending James Watt presumably by train to Birmingham. And perhaps Birmingham would like to help us to um fund the uh, a proper artwork, not necessarily though you see a statue of Murray. Um, I have in mind something a bit more creative, um, perhaps a kinetic artwork you see, which I think Murray would have approved of. So uh, something that moves and driven by solar and wind power, which I think, you know, he would be on with the, the next thing, wouldn't he? And so I don't, I certainly don't propose melting down James Watt and creating a, a different um, Georgian gentleman out of the bronze. Good. I'm sorry, I forgot the name. It's Diana Dark is the, I remembered almost immediately afterwards, of course, the, the author of the book are, it's called Stealing from the Saracens, which is, a, is very interesting, convincing. And I was put onto that by my friend who lives, who's from Karachi and lives in Karachi. And she's um, seen a talk by Diana Dark about that topic. And you can find her on, on YouTube talking about this, uh, the influence from further east for our neo-Gothic styling. Well, Gothic and then neo-Gothic. There is a thought which is crossing through my mind, which is that, that I, we, we've heard the argument that, that Leeds was a woolen-based town which became an engineering based town then a city and now is becoming a digitally based town city and digital arts maybe aren't as open to being put on public display as in the ways that you've been talking about as, as the physical arts of of painting sculpture and all, and all the rest oh but i think that you know that it is though um i mean the shifting lights that we have now you know yes. and the and light night that's yeah. all digital, isn't it? You know, a lot, well, oh, a lot yes. of it is now. Oh. And so, I mean, there's so many more strands I could have brought oh. to this. Um, I, I didn't want to have you here until past sherry time, but uh, <laughs> it's um, it's an endless topic, really, isn't it? Um, and uh, I, I hope it was just rather um, 
mainly a, a sort of relaxing and, and pleasant uh, Eiffel, um, you know, these these wonderful buildings one after another, as Garant uh, says about making the sun sunshine work for you. And I, mean, I do deliberately go at the right times of day and when the sun is out to ca capture particular scenes, you know, and wait, hang around, waiting for the sun to be just right. Um, this is a, a, a quite a lot of patience required. I, I, I just seen a chat from somebody um, from who's from Cheshire, who is oh, in yes. Cheshire. Um, and I was thinking, well, you've mentioned some of the things which you're involved with. Uh, can I suggest to this person from Cheshire that they come along in September when Leeds hosts uh, uh, as part of the National Heritage Open Days um, Festival and looks at may maybe hears and sees a lot more about Leeds from all the participants that we hope will be taking part in Heritage Open Days in Leeds, just as they will be in, in, in Cheshire and elsewhere in England. Because there's, there's an awful lot which people in Leeds are proud of and are happy to talk about and, and show people around. Yeah, it's always a, an amazingly full programme. Yes. Well done, Merrill and team. <laughs> <laughs> and Garrels as well. Fantastic. Granary Wharf has been mentioned. Yes, that's... Um... You, you mean the weekend market? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I think that that had its heyday just before Sunday shopping, didn't it? When having that kind of thing was, you know, where else could you go to see, to shops in the, or, you know, a retail mm. experience on a Sunday? And once we started to have retail open more generally on a Sunday, I think that suffered. But it it would be good to have more life there rather than those arches just used for car parking. Yeah, certainly. Well, the mention of retail there um, reminds me that one, the, the next series of talks uh, under the Leeds Civic Trust banner is the um, now almost traditional um, lunchtime, sorry, Leeds in your lunchtime talks given by Dr. Kevin Grady coming up um, at one o'clock every Wednesday in February. And one of them is about retail. It's the third, I think it's the third of his four talks um, on the 21st. It's called From the Bazaar and Shambles to John Lewis and Beyond. The Rise and Fall of Leeds Shopping Centres and Department Stores 1825 to 2024. So that's uh, that would be a talk about, about retail and how the city centre has changed in many ways over, over that century. And uh, they're they're all at the Minster, aren't they, Roderick? They're all at the Minster. They're all free of charge. No need to book. Just turn up at mm. um, just coming up to one o'clock. Um, just an hour or so of of Kevin and his, to, to my mind, always fascinating talks about the history of, of, of Leeds. Um, the first one is on the, the seventh. Historic panoramas and prospects of Leeds, sixteen eighty five to nineteen hundred. Second one on the 14th, which is Mr. Cossins and his remarkable map, which appears in every historical book about Leeds, as far as I can see. And it's a wonderful, wonderful piece of work. Then the, the one on retail on the 21st and ending on, on Wednesday the 28th with a talk about Wellington Street, Wellington Place, Whitehall Road, that area, how it changed from a hunting park into slowly um, becoming urbanised and then uh, the, the, the railways took over and now it's been changed yet again and is becoming a huge um, office office area and um, replacing the decayed landscapes which were the railways once they left and the, and the means of centralised more. So that's a slight digression from, from talking about the weekend market at Granary Wharf but I thought I'd make it somewhere or other. <laughs> That's fine. Um, very good. Um, I'm just looking and uh, seeing, uh, it's great to see so many folk I know who are online today, but also uh, people I, I don't know. So a lo lovely mixture there. And uh, I've been asked about um, Thwaite Mills, any thoughts, well, and, and generally to everybody, any thoughts about the future of Thwaite, uh, Thwaite Mills, which is uh, threatened with mm -hmm being sold off by the city council or they actually it's only leased by by them anyway isn't it on a long lease i don't i don't understand the arrangement but um uh, because of the city council budget situation it's thought that this might have to uh, be closed as a as a museum which would be a great shame and surely there can be some hybrid approach there where 
some commercialization of part of the site is the quid pro quo for continuing to have it as a historic mill site. You know, there's been a, a mill there for so many centuries and uh, yeah, it would be a great shame if that if that um, oh. is changed out of all recognition and in no longer any public access. A thought which crossed my mind, which I know is overly optimistic, is that as the building is actually, I understand, owned by the Canals and River Trust, um, it would be a wonderful place for them to have some sort of museum as, on top of what we've got there at the moment. But they're, they're probably as strapped for cash as the city council is. Um, so I don't think that's likely to happen. But if if there's anyone listening with the, the odd few million to spend, well, that would be a, a useful place to, to put it into. Would serve a real a real purpose for the people of Leeds and and around. And the round hole. And, and the round hole lodges. And the John Barrow yeah, yeah, yeah. and, 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 and 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 temple works and all the rest of it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I'm rather afraid about the British Library having had this uh, horrendous hacking experience, you know, and their catalogue yes. having been so compromised, whether their attention and funding will be um, drawn into that rather than thinking about the way that they might well, inhabit temple works. Well, that thought across my mind, especially hearing that they spent maybe, maybe £7 million from reserves on dealing with the damage from that hacking into them that's an awful lot of money which they haven't got to put anywhere else mm. um, but nothing's been said yet no no i mean we shouldn't perhaps be speculating out loud in this manner but anyway <laughs> i don't suppose it'll make the headlines shock no. horror civic trust um you know comes out with things that they shouldn't be saying <laughs> yes. well so that was my own personal view um, no, I quite agree. But on a different topic, I quite agree with Jana that more of our creativity needs to go to making the city centre, as well as other parts of Leeds, more child friendly. But generally, cutting down on on vehicular traffic um, is one of the things that will help towards making it more child friendly. And uh, I, for one, am absolutely pro the reduction of um, through traffic wherever possible. Um, and I, I know that I do occasionally accept lifts, but I do, for the most part, go on my own two feet and by public transport. And um, I can tell you that uh, there's still far too much traffic in town, even now, even with the changes. Um, and so uh, to be friendly towards children and uh, visitors and to all, all of us, I mean, most of us, if we can walk, we are pedestrians for some of our time, aren't we? So I think... Uh, None of us would want to go back to having two-way traffic on Brigger and all that, would we? Um, so the fact that it's slightly more inconvenient to get at some of the city centre spots, uh, I think, um, is not uh, is not so much of a problem when we think about all the gains that we have as a result of these changes. So on that uh, slightly carpy but also optimistic note. <laughs> I think there's, there's nothing else coming in the chat, so shall we yeah. wind up here? May I, I thank you, certainly, Rachel, for your talk. It, it's a fascinating, and it reminds me that every time you walk anywhere in Leeds, look around mm. you and see what you can see, because it never stops to be interesting and fascinating, and things are changing, and the old is worth looking at, and, and the new is worth looking at as well. Um, right. So thank you for your talk. Thank you for your... Um, wonderful photography, which um, always seems to capture things looking at looking looking in in, in fine shape. Yes, uh, it's funny how I seem to ditch the photos that uh, don't make Leeds look like the best destination on earth. But uh... the, sun, the sun always shines; it follows you around the place. Anyway, many thanks again. And, okay. Um, I, I've mentioned our next Leeds Civic Trust talks every Wednesday in February. Uh, so thank everyone for coming. Um, your uh, and your, you know, those who've expressed their their thanks on the chat. Thank you for that because uh, Rachel really very much deserve those thanks. So thank you and goodbye to everybody. Cheerio for now then. Bye bye. Bye.